Well, again, if you would take out your Bibles, this time turning to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, we begin our study through this wonderful book this morning. And it's a letter in the New Testament that's quite interesting uh, for a number of reasons, but just a couple to point out at the beginning here for us. Uh, First off, it's a letter with an undefined author. It's a letter with an undefined audience. It has an undefined date of composition, and it also addresses a somewhat undefined issue. Now, for these reasons, many are sometimes apprehensive to engage with Hebrews in a serious way. Now, having said those things, I don't in any way mean to indicate that we don't know what Hebrews is about. We'll see as we come to study this wonderful book, even in the first four verses this morning, it's abundantly clear what it is about. And so despite what we don't know about the letter, what we can know is abundantly clear. It really can be summarized in these three words. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. He is all in all. And this wonderful epistle is all about pointing to Jesus Christ, who is all in all, who is Savior, who is prophet, priest, and king, who is the very one that all of Scripture to that point had been pointing to. He is the finality of God's revelation to us and the assurance of our salvation. So with that, let's turn to Hebrews 1 and verses 1 through 4 this morning. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature, And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's pray. Most gracious Lord, we confess to you our weakness and inability to will ourselves toward the knowledge of God that we ought to have and to conform ourselves to this wonderful word. But that makes us all the more grateful to confess our utter dependence upon your grace to bring us to knowledge and conformity unto God by faith. Hold forth to us Christ this morning from this text by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit and captivate our hearts with him, the source of our life, the anchor of our souls. In his name, amen. Well, to give us just a little bit of a background of this book, which we said is somewhat undefined, and the reason that is, is you'll notice that the author does not identify himself, as so many of the New Testament epistles do. And so from the outset, we're not sure who was writing this, and therefore we're not exactly sure from where he was writing or to whom he was writing. The very name, Letter to the Hebrews, was actually ascribed by scribes after the fact because of the content of this letter, which we'll mention more about in the middle, or in a little bit. But concerning the background of the book, I want to begin by actually referring you back to a gospel to give us a little bit of context here. And it's because in Matthew's gospel, chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus asked his disciples a most important question. He says to them, who do you say that I am? That comes after asking, what are people saying about me? And they say, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he looks at his followers, those whom he's called to himself and says, but who do you say that I am? I bring that out because in a real sense, that's the question that this book also seeks to answer. Who do we say that Jesus is? And all of us can benefit from asking ourselves that question because it's perhaps the most important question that any of us will ever answer. How would you answer that? Who do you say that Jesus is? Well, back in Matthew 16, Peter provided the right answer. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is absolutely true. 
Now again, though, if we know this, then why are we giving our time to study this? Well, it's for the plain and simple fact that such a confession can become so familiar to our ears and flow so easily off of our lips that sometimes it can come to ring hollow. The reason we have cliches in our culture and in every culture is because oftentimes they're true, but they're so repeated that they just become something that's just said. And we don't even sometimes think about why we're saying those things. And unfortunately, that can be true of our very confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so do we understand, do we believe the meaning behind our confession of Jesus as the Christ? That was the issue among the audience of Hebrews, as we see developing in this letter. Now, we're not told that directly, but the context demonstrates it. Because as we've mentioned, the entire book is an exposition of who Christ is. That is its central goal, is to proclaim Christ and how he ushered in the new covenant by fulfilling the old. It's also replete with warnings to the hearer, such as, Pay close attention to what you have heard. Hold fast your confidence. Examine your hearts. Strive to enter his rest. Leave elementary doctrine and go on to the deeper things. And do not neglect meeting together. These are but a handful, a sampling of what we find in this book, all indicating that there is a concern on the part of the author that his hearers be called to faithfulness in Christ, to remember their confession, to hold fast to him. And in fact, that gets us to one unique aspect of this letter in that it shares a different format, or rather holds a different format than a lot of the other New Testament letters, in that it really is more a written sermon. We get that in part by the author's own words. In chapter 13 and verse 22, he calls this letter a word of exhortation. He tells his audience there, bear with my word of exhortation. And that word exhortation can just as easily be translated a sermon. And so in this way, it is a pastoral epistle, you could say. But the point is this. What you have here among the audience of this letter in its original context is a congregation that's in the midst of a crisis of faith, as it were. Some were defecting, some were neglecting the assembly of the saints, some were turning to the old ways of worship, saying, well, maybe it's just better to go this way. And all of them were feeling the pressure of the challenges of following Christ in a world that looks with contempt upon the church and upon the Savior whom she confesses. And so into that context, the author, a shepherd of this flock, he writes to remind them of the all-important answer to the question, who is Jesus? And the answer that we will see, not only in today's sermon, but as we study the fullness of this book, is that he is very God of very God. The finality of God's revelation to man who has secured an eternal redemption for us and who reigns from heaven on high. Say that again more simply. He is God. He's the finality of God's revelation. He secured redemption and he reigns from heaven on high. Now at this point we want to jump into our text, but one other just side note as we study this epistle, just a little bit of dating for you, because the question is, when was this written? Was it an earlier epistle, a later one? And because we don't know the author or the audience, that's not exactly clear. But internal evidence would point to this being written prior to 70 AD. Because in 70 AD was when Rome came and essentially took Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. And since that date, there has no longer been the old covenant way of worship taking place in the temple in Jerusalem. But in this book, we see present tense references to that worship of the priests doing their job daily in the temple, meaning that it seems that the author was writing at a time when that was still going on in Jerusalem, thus prior to 70 AD. And so probably it was written sometime in the 60s. And the audience, though we can't know for sure, was probably a majority of Greek-speaking Jews who had been converted to Christ. 
though certainly there were Gentiles mixed in as well. Because we must remember that even Gentile Christians, what was their Bible? It was the Old Testament Scriptures. And so the myriad of Old Testament references and expositions in the book of Hebrews presupposes that whether Jew or Gentile, the Old Testament was their Scripture, Christ was the fulfillment, and therefore they would have an understanding of the things that He brings forth. And so with all of that answering the question, who is Jesus? The first thing the author points out in his opening words is that Jesus is the one who brings greater revelation. If you look at verses 1 and the first part of verse 2, there's a contrast put forth there that long ago at many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. There's one way of God speaking in the past, the former ways. And here's the contrast. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Now notice the two details that the author points to in contrasting the the previous revelation with the revelation that has now come in Christ. Number one, there's the way. The former way was many. Many times it took place successively throughout history and in many ways. Sometimes it came in the form of a vision. Sometimes it came in the form of direct, audible speaking from God to man. We can think of the experience of Moses so many times. Other times it came through a a mediator, maybe a theophany or the appearance of the angel of the Lord. There were many times in many ways that God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. And that brings us to the second contrast that the author puts forth, not only the way, but by whom he brought it, that is, by the prophets. It was delivered. But now, it's come through the Son. And now, the context here, we said that its recipients would have been familiar with the background, the Old Testament background, one way or another, that the author is pulling in here. And one of the key things is that from Genesis 3, that is from the fall of man and God's response to that in bringing curse upon man, the ground and the serpent, but also giving the hope of promise that the seed of woman would one day conquer the serpent and therefore evil and sin. From that point forward until the time of the Messiah, the Jewish people were looking for the pinnacle of God's revelation. And unfortunately, the Jewish people today are still looking for the pinnacle of God's revelation, having not received Christ. But the reason that is important is to understand that he's appealing in part to his reader's background, that they would have understood that redemptive history was progressive. It was revealed continuously further throughout time, and it was working toward this apex That's what they were looking for. That's what the early church understood as well. And we see this even in the response of the disciples. Many places, but one notably in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. After Jesus' resurrection and he was with them teaching right before his ascension to the right hand of the Father, the disciples came around him and asked. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now. They obviously had a a little misunderstanding about what this apex of redemptive history was going to look like. But nevertheless, they were right in, in looking for a fulfillment of all things. That was the trajectory of the entire Old Testament. And so our author appeals to that old prophecy and God's progressive revelation as a reminder that all of that was pointing toward and working toward a definite end which explains why he uses that phrase, the last days. The word modifying days is eschatos. It's where we get the word eschatology from, last things. What he's emphasizing is that this is the final stage of redemptive history. It has come to a pinnacle in Christ. Now, we'll say more about Jesus as son in a moment, but for just the time being, let's remain more toward the surface and consider why Jesus' status as the Son of God makes this revelation greater. Well, one commentator puts it this way. He says that it's a qualitative difference. 
meaning he's not looking at the former revelation and saying, well, it wasn't as reliable. It, it wasn't as truthful. You can't depend upon it now, so now you need to look to Christ. No, it was certainly dependable. Because why? It was the inerrant word of God. But there is a qualitative difference in that the one who has brought it to forth now is not only a messenger of God as a created being, but rather he is the eternal son of God who has come and taken on flesh and revealed fully God to us as he has desired to make himself known. Jesus himself thought of himself this way. In Matthew 21, he tells a parable in verses 33 and following about a man who plants a vineyard. He's a master, a landowner, and so he plants himself a vineyard and he leases it to some tenants, some people to work the ground, keep the grapes, take care of things, and bring in the harvest. And then this master, he goes away for a while. Well, the growing season happens, the time for harvest comes, and at that point he sends his servants back to get his fruit, to, to reap what was rightfully his. Well, the tenants, instead of giving what the king what was his, the master what was his, they take the servants and they kill them. And so the king sends another group of servants back to reap what is his. And so they kill that group of servants. So then he finally says, well, I will send my son. Or surely they will listen to him. But instead they take the son and kill him too. Now the point, obviously, this was Jesus making a prophecy about what was going to happen to him. But underlying all that is this idea that the servants weren't less reliable. They were there doing the king's business. But the relationship of the son to the master, to the king, brought a finality to the message. That is, there was no one greater that could follow. There was no one more perfectly representative of the master than his very own son whom he sent forth. And that is what has come in Christ Jesus. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus brings greater revelation. Secondly, we see that Jesus is greater than the prophets. Verse 2 goes on, speaking of this son, says, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. That is, the reason that Jesus brings greater revelation is the same reason that he is greater than the prophets. He is the son of the living God. But here the author takes care to explain to us what that means. And this is a doctrine that has been the center of much confusion even in our present day, despite the church's consensus on this issue in the 4th and 5th centuries, spoken to through creeds and councils. We already know coming to this text that the central emphasis is the same as John 1, Matthew 1, Luke 1, Colossians 1, and so on and so forth. We could say the entire text of the New Testament, and that is that Jesus is God. Now there's an interesting linguistic reality that's somewhat obscured here in our translation in the English, where it says there, He was appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. To us, that reads just kind of like a listing of facts. But the way the, the Greek language is structured there is it almost puts these two things in contrast. In other words, reading like this, that Jesus was appointed heir of all things, yet the world was created through him. And the reason it might want to contrast that is because those are two really different things that in one sense, Jesus is an heir. He is the rightful inheritor of all of creation. That sounds more like something that would befall mankind, right? But yet, the world was created through him. And so you have this appeal, really, to Jesus' divinity, his deity, and his humanity in one sentence. The point is, that Jesus has a right over all things, really in two very different ways. In one sense, he has a, a natural right, if we could use that language, or maybe would say an inherent right over all things because he brought them into existence. He is the source. He is the eternal word by which all things came into being. Yet, in another capacity, as the Son, he has been appointed. 
that is put forth, set over as the one to rule and reign over this creation. Now, there's two very important points that we need to make about understanding the Trinity right here. And any time you dive into trying to understand, comprehend the Holy Triune God, your head's liable to hurt a little bit. But that is no reason to keep us from pursuing that because the Scriptures call us, exhort us to pursue just that. And beyond that, there is so much confusion, lack of clarity, and misunderstanding around the doctrine of our triune God today that we ourselves need to make sure that we are understanding the Scriptures as we are called to understand them. Because the very nature of our salvation is that we have been restored to fellowship with God. We have been brought to know Him and to make Him known. So the first thing about this Trinitarian theology that we see here is really can be represented by this question. If all things were created through Him, if all things were created through Christ, then was Jesus created? No. Now, what about groups that teach this today? The Jehovah's Witnesses would be one of the key representatives of this theology. In ancient times, it was condemned as the heresy of Arianism, and that is that the Son is a created being. He is a creature. In other words, you could put it this way, there was a time when he was not. The scriptures teach no such thing. He was the one through whom God created the world. Or you can go to John 1, and it says that through him, all things came into being. Apart from him was not anything made that has been made. Now, you may well know that Jehovah's Witnesses is one of the key representatives of this theology. Their Bible reads differently than ours in John 1. Instead of saying that the Word was God, it says the Word was a God. And they make their argument for that, which is not based in biblical exegesis. But nevertheless, their Bible still says, apart from Him was not anything made that has been made. And so even by their own confession, they're contradicting themselves. The Scriptures are clear as to who the Son is. He is God, the eternal Word. Now, secondly, and this gets more at the incarnation or the humanity of Christ. But the second thing of Trinitarian theology here is that the appointment of Christ as heir, especially here as it's used in Hebrews 1, the heir of all things, it necessarily encompasses his incarnation. And by that, we mean that act in which he took on flesh and was born, brought forth in human form. Philippians 2. Colossians 1 and in other places. Calvin puts it this way, commenting on this passage. He says, The word heir is, is ascribed to Christ as manifested in the flesh. Now, at this point we may be saying, okay, kind of getting lost here. What, what does that mean? Why is that important? Well, here we got to jump back again to this Old Testament background that the author is working from and say it this way. In Genesis 1, and two, man was created as what? The Son of God. Okay, and as God's Son, He was to be the heir of all creation. It's phrased this way, to have dominion over the creatures, to go forth, subdue, fill, multiply. And He was to have blessed fellowship with God as His Father. That was what Adam was to be. The Bible supports that in many ways, but one way we can see is actually in the use of a genealogy. In Luke's genealogy, the third chapter of his book, verses 23 through 28, he traces back the genealogy of Christ. He starts with Jesus. He says, son of Joseph, who was son of Haley, son of Mathot, and it goes back and back through the generations to whom? To Adam. Son of Adam, son of God. And it uses that language. Now, we know what happened in Genesis 3 was what? That sin broke man's right to dominion and his right to sonship, and it forfeited the inheritance as it were. And so that's why it is very important that Christ came in the flesh and that he has been appointed the heir of all things. He has been put in the place to take the place of Adam and to succeed where Adam failed. 
What does that mean for us? Here's where it really gets important. Maybe we should say continues to remain important. It's that the only way we are restored to that which was to be ours initially, that is God's creation in Adam, in the perfect uh, existence in Eden, that dominion, that fellowship, that sonship, the only way we're restored to that is through union with he who has been appointed the true heir of all things. Only through union to this Christ may we inherit the blessings that we forfeited by our sin. The Shorter Catechism, question 21, makes this point very clearly, and it's just echoing the Chalcedonian definition which came in the 5th century. The question asks, who is the Redeemer of God's elect? The answer is, the only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God became man, and so was and continueth to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever and ever. Now that's all in verse 2. Verse 3 really continues just to support that same idea. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. That's emphasizing Christ's deity. God's glory is his nature. This is fully expressed in the person of Jesus Christ. But maybe another important point is, is notable here that it's, it's seen in Christ not as a reflection, as it were. Not in the way that Adam was created as a creature to be a reflection, because Christ is no creature, but rather as an emanation. The glory of God is within him. His essence is the glory of God, and it goes forth from him. It radiates, to use the language of the scripture here, forth. This is about, as we've said, who Jesus is. And the comment about him upholding the world is but a supporting statement to that. You want some evidence that Christ is God, truly God? Well, look no further than the fact that he is the one who upholds the world. The idea there is not looking so much at creation, as in the creative act, but rather it's looking at the fact that everything continues to exist because Christ actively upholds it. It's the idea that if he were to remove his hand from all that is going on, it would all cease to exist. Christ upholds the world by his word of power. I remember going to a Bible school when I was a kid, and and, uh, one of my favorite crafts that we ever did was you took a little plastic cup and some yarn, which you tied to the top of it, and you filled the cup with water, and then you slung it around in a circle, right? which was fascinating, you know, as a seven-year-old, because the water stays in the cup. Well, what happens is if you let go of that cup, what's going to happen, which it always did? It goes flying, it crashes down, the water goes everywhere. And the whole point of that exercise was to show that that's kind of how the world works. God holds it in his hand. He keeps it revolving. He keeps it going, and it depends upon him. If you were to remove his hand, it all comes crashing down. That's what the text says about Christ. He not only created, but he sustains the universe. Now, there is certainly a deep temptation. We certainly see it around us, but it's it's in us too because there's still sin within us. We've not yet been perfected, and nor will we be until Christ comes again or we go to be with the Lord. But there's that temptation to avoid deep theology. Now, as Reformed folk, we tend to like deeper theology, but sometimes in the Trinity we get to a point where it's just like, I just don't think I should wade into those waters. And I simply want to remind you, maybe this will help you to minister to others, but remind you of the occasion for this letter. We've said the occasion for this letter is Christians in a crisis of faith. Now, that's interesting because the author doesn't come and just try to give them a pat on the back, you know, say, Get your chin up. It'll be okay. You know, give those cliches we were talking about. No, he comes to Christians. And he's addressing them as those who are struggling. It's as if he's saying, are you struggling with following Christ? Are you struggling with not dying to self daily? Are you thinking of other paths? Are you avoiding the study of the scriptures and so forth? You know what you need? You need to know who Christ is. He doesn't skirt around the deep theology. He runs to it because ultimately what we are called to know is Christ because in knowing him, 
as He has revealed Himself to us, we have eternal life. So the less we know of Christ, the more likely we are to drift from Him. And certainly that's true even of believers, not in the sense of losing salvation, but in the sense of we make mistakes. And sometimes we incur the discipline of the Lord upon ourselves. The less we know of Christ, the more we are likely to deviate. And this letter makes a humongous point to call believers back to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now being greater than the prophets, it goes on to say that He is the one. Jesus is the one who accomplishes a greater work. In the second part of verse 3, not only does he uphold the universe, but after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Here is the continuance, you might say, of the major pastoral exhortation of this text. That is the encouragement that comes along. It's where it gets practical, we might say. And it's in this summary of what Jesus has done for his people. That is, not only do we need to remember who Jesus is in himself, we need to remember what he has done, paid for our sins. Now, this is that wonderful doctrine that we call assurance. And the author of Hebrews wants his hearers to have it. Again, there's an Old Testament background here. It's the fullness of the Mosaic Law, which teaches us a number of things, but simply put, we could put it this way. Sin defiles, it makes unclean, it alienates from God's presence, and so purification is necessary to be brought back into God's presence, to be restored. And of course, that's where the priestly office came in. Their role was to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people, to perform acts of cleansing that the people might come into the presence of God. But the point that the author's keying in on here and makes explicit later in the book is that they never sat down. Now, I don't mean they didn't go home to rest, but in their duties, they never sat down. Why was that? Because the work was never done. Now, I got this example from Kevin DeYoung, so credit where credit is due, but I heard him make this point one time that after working all day, you're tired, you come home, you got more chores to do, so you get your chores done around the house and you hurry up to try to get it done well, and finally it's all put to rest. The evening is done. What do you like to do before you go to bed? Just sit. It's good just to sit down, and you do that when the day's work is done. What does the text say? After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Echoing, of course, Psalm 110.1, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now ask yourself, what can be more encouraging and assuring than that? Because the readers understand, just as we do, the holiness of God, His justice, His wrath, His coming judgment. And the author holds forth Christ. Referencing what? His revelation, his purification for sins. After making purification, he sat down saying, it is done, completed. In other words, two things are in view of this finality, revelation and redemption. And the confession speaks of the necessity of Scripture, the necessity of revelation this way. It says that it is just that necessary for all things according to life and practice and faith. But it goes on, says, those former ways of God's revealing His will unto His people now being ceased. That's the confession's way of pointing out. We're not looking for any further revelation. We're not looking to something, a further pinnacle to be reached. The mountaintop has come in Christ Jesus. And so to say that revelation is ongoing is to hold that there is greater revelation than that which has come through the Son. It's to say that His is not good enough. And the same thing applies to redemption. To say that it is not absolutely certain for His elect is to deny the efficacy of Christ's work completely. He said it is finished. He sat down. There is no further work to be accomplished. And this is, if I can just be 
straightforward. This is the insidiousness of the Arminian viewpoint. It's that in seeking to emphasize the responsibility of man, which is not in itself a bad thing, it rejects the finished work of Christ, and it straps you with the requirements of the law, and it extends a grace insufficient to do what the law demands. In that, it offers us no assurance, no confidence that our salvation is secure, that Christ has done what he said he has done in the Scriptures. And so, I certainly want to speak to the children here, but this applies to all of us. So, let's all really think about this. Has anybody ever told you to stop trying? Now, maybe if you're a perfectionist or something like that, somebody said, Try, stop trying so hard, it's good enough. And that can be good advice. But I mean, has anybody ever told you as a matter of life advice, like, quit trying? Don't try anything else ever again. Just sit there. I highly doubt it. If they have, you probably know it's not good advice. Well, the scandal of the gospel is that Christ says, quit trying. It is finished. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't call us to certain obedience, to pursue obedience. But he does not call us to obedience as a way to earn. He calls us to obedience as a way of gratitude for what he has earned for us. And thus, in the gospel, you can have perfect assurance for your soul in Christ because he has sat down and he reigns from the right hand of the Father. And none of his elect will be taken from his hand, nor will he fail to accomplish the good work he began in you. Finally, our text concludes this morning with the fourth way that Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than the angels. Now, verse 4 might seem odd and in many ways perhaps anticlimactic. We've come, we keep using the illustration to the mountaintop of Christ being God made flesh. Now we're talking about the angels. But basically what the author is doing here is actually returning to his opening point, but coming with a different approach. It's, it's sometimes what scholars call an inclusio. That's basically where you bookend a section of thought with the same idea stated in maybe slightly different ways. And so what the author is doing here is presenting Jesus' superiority to the angels as a way of reminding his readers that the word spoken by Jesus is greater, sure, and final. So as such, we don't need to say much on this point, but we do need to make uh, just an observation that the author is not likely worried about angel worship. And this is going to be important for next week when we look at the rest of chapter 1. But he's probably not concerned about angel worship. That did happen, but it wasn't very prevalent. That probably wasn't the issue there. Uh, more likely, the emphasis on angels comes from the common view on angels in Second Temple Judaism and in the New Testament for that matter. And that was the view that angels served as mediators of the message. And we see examples of this. Um, the early church, or the, the Jewish people, took it from Exodus 3, 2, for example, where the angel of the Lord is mentioned in the burning bush scenario. But we also see it in the New Testament, Acts 7. It's mentioned there about the angel who spoke to him, speaking of Moses in the wilderness. And again, in Galatians 3, Paul references the angels as a source of the mediation of the law. And so the point is, they were reverenced, rightly, as God's agents. But as we'll see next week, they were but servants. Again, it's a comparison of lesser to greater, the angels being lesser, the sun being greater. And finally, to cap it all off, the name given to the sun, it says, is more excellent than theirs. Maybe you'll recall last week where we spent some time thinking about what is in a name. It refers to that person's nature, their character, their essence. And the name being referred to here is certainly nothing less than that name which is I Am, the one who is, very God of very God, King of kings, Lord of lords. And in chapter 2, we'll see the author pick back up on this comparison that 
if the angels, mere creatures, delivered a, a reliable message, how much more the message of the eternally begotten Son of God. Thus, we should believe and cling to the revelation that has come to us in Christ Jesus. Rest in the assurance that it gives to us. William Lane, in his commentary on Hebrews, closes out his section this way. He says, The reader's lethargy derives from their failure to grasp the full significance of Christ. They were prepared to abandon their confession because they had lost the realization of its significance. That is so poignant because it's so, such a prevalent temptation to us. In simple terms, to take our eyes off Christ and put them on something else. And that's a common issue among all who waver in their faith. That's the reason the Scripture calls Him the source, the rock, the foundation, the cornerstone, etc. He is the very thing we need. He is all in all. In other words, He's not a mere addition to our lives. He is the resurrection and the life. So true religion, therefore, doesn't make your life better. True religion is able to give you life. So to whatever degree we deviate from Christ is the degree to which we will lack assurance and comfort and joy and increase of grace in our lives. And the scriptures call us to pursue and to seek to obtain all of those things because they are extended to us in Christ. Perfect assurance because his work is perfect. So let us be diligent then to know Christ as he is, as God and Lord, Savior of our souls, that we may have assurance of our salvation in our souls and a firm foundation for perseverance in the faith. Let's pray. Oh God, there is simply nothing that compares to your glory and your power. And we fall so short of the thankfulness that we ought to have to you in Christ for revealing yourself and our salvation with finality in him. But how grateful we are that these scriptures are full of examples of weak men and women just like ourselves. And replete with words of encouragement reminding us that we have perfect assurance for our souls in Jesus. Thank you for such amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen.